Good evening. Good evening. Not too bad. How many of you came here for some good fellowship this weekend? How many of you came here to be encouraged? How many of you came here to uh, get your toes stepped on? Okay, keep your hands up. I don't see if you didn't raise your hands, so I know who to preach at. <laughs> How many of you came here to uh, get a break from ministry? <laughs> Seven honest people here, right? Uh, it's good to be together tonight. I'm excited about what God has for us, and as Brother Keyshawn was sharing, I'm supposed to talk about culture, and as I was looking at their theme and uh, praying over what I should share, what I did is I took our three words, empowerment, empathy, and what's the other word? Equity. And I just used each one of those for, our, for the three topics that I'm supposed to share. We're going to start tonight with empowerment. And this isn't really going to touch on culture. Now, tomorrow morning, uh, equity, we're going to talk about culture, and that's going to be more teaching. Tonight's preaching. Uh, so, is that because tomorrow's teacher, tomorrow's preaching? Oh, okay. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we're going to look at culture, just define that. Uh, and then Sunday morning, the last session, we're going to look at, so how do we, in understanding culture, how do we minister to, to another culture? And again, that's going to be what we teach you. And tonight, we're going to uh, get in the word, we're going to look at empowerment. Empowerment. The word empowerment means authority or power given to someone to do something. We need empowerment to do ministry. So the title tonight is Empowerment. You don't find it in the mirror. So after we got here and unload our stuff and I was changing my clothes and I pulled my sweater on and I knew it didn't look good, so I went to my wife and said, Honey, uh, here, help me look good. And she said, No. Uh, she thought I said, Do I look good? Uh, <laughs> and then she fixed me. Okay? Uh, I didn't have a mirror in front of me, so I couldn't tell. But then I told him my voice, I said, here, give him a brush, go comb your hair. Because his hair was kind of like, woo, and he needed to, to get it straight. So he goes to the mirror, and he combs his hair. Now he looks good. Uh, the mirror gives us a, a picture of, of where we're at and what, you know, what needs to go this way and what goes that way and what goes that way and, you know, what goes this way and, you know, whatever. Uh, we look in the mirror, and we straighten things out, and we get things figured out. And too often in ministry... When we need to be empowered, we go to the mirror. And when we look in the mirror, we see someone that's born again, praise God. We see somebody that wants to reach the world for Christ. In fact, that's why you're here. You're not paying money to do something besides you and me equipped, right? And you are investing time in ministry. Wherever, wherever you're at, you're, you are here like preaching to the choir tonight. That's why I can teach twice and only preach once, because you're the choir, all right? Uh, no amen. Okay, good. Uh, you can look in the mirror and you can say, you know what, I, I have a heart for this. You can look back on your past and say, you know what, God has prepared me for this. You can even uh, look at a, a spiritual gift test and I'm gifted for what I'm doing. And, wow, this is great. And too often, that's how we get our empowerment is in the mirror. Empowerment, definition for you, is authority or power given to someone to do something. Authority or power given to someone to do something. Text tonight is going to be in Exodus chapter 3. And we're going to look at Moses tonight. Moses was called to ministry to a very difficult task. Before we get to Exodus 3, where I have for our text, I'd like to uh, tell you about Exodus chapter 2. 
So we, we know the story of Moses. You all know, teaching your kids' clubs and so on. Moses is born a Hebrew. His mom doesn't want him to be to be killed like all the other Hebrew babies, and so she puts him in a bag. You know the story, right? So he's adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, raised in the palace. Like God's hand is on Moses. Amen? Amen. Just because the mask on doesn't mean you can't be with me, all right? Amen? Amen? So God's hand is on Moses. Moses is special. Like, God's got plans for him, unlike anybody else, right? Good, I was hoping nobody would be with me on that one. Moses isn't special, by the way. And we're going to get to this with our third, uh, our second piece. I'll give you four P's as far as where we get our uh, empowerment. Moses isn't anybody special. He's just like me and you. Or you could say, yeah, he is special because everybody's special. Moses is raised in the palace. He becomes, in a sense, an Egyptian. When people saw Moses, you know what they said? Oh, he's an Egyptian. When he went, when he fled to the to the uh, the, the wilderness of Midian or whatever, uh, and the, the ladies came up and they were at the well, they went back and told their dad, they said, he was a, an Egyptian helped us. So he looked like an Egyptian, right? But he wasn't Egyptian, he was a Hebrew, he had Hebrew blood. So there he is, he's raised in the palace, and somewhere along the line, I don't know when it was that Moses discovered it, uh, you know, maybe when he had his COVID test and they took his blood and they figured out that, yeah, my blood's Hebrew, it's not Egyptian. Uh, he realized, you know what, I, I'm, I'm a Hebrew. So even though he lives like an Egyptian, he knows the culture, the language, everything of the, of the Egyptians, in his heart, he's still a Hebrew. And the next chapter 2 says that one day he went out and he sees an Egyptian beating up on a Hebrew. And Moses made a choice that day. Now, he's raised in the palace. He has some position. He has some clout. He's got some authority. And he steps in to settle the fight. And he does what sometimes the bigger boys do, the younger boys in our house. They get a little aggressive in settling the fights, right? Uh, and he stepped in to settle this fight, but he actually ended up killing the Egyptian. Now, that hasn't happened in our house yet. Uh, but he killed the Egyptian to protect the Hebrew. So even though he's a Hebrew, he's clearly chose his side. He's helping the Hebrews here. I think in Exodus chapter 2, when Moses, as a young man of, what, 20 years of age, I think he already knows that God's call is for him to deliver the Hebrews. I think so. The next day, Moses goes out. We don't know what he was going out to do, but Moses went out the next day, and he sees two Hebrews fighting. And he steps in to solve this fight. But when he steps in and says, hey guys, don't do, you know, so quickly, you know, be nice. Kind of like how the big sister settles the fights with the younger brothers, right? Uh, you know, cool it, guys. Uh, and one guy says, hey, you're going to kill us like you did the Egyptian yesterday? And they weren't really big on Moses stepping in and solving their problems. And when Moses realized that these guys know that I killed an Egyptian yesterday, he became afraid. And he soon finds out that Pharaoh knows what he did. And Pharaoh's going to kill him. So he runs. He runs. He runs to the wilderness, goes to the land of Midian. That's where we come to our text in Exodus chapter 3. So let's go to Exodus chapter 3. And let's just jump in here and, and see this story. Now Moses kept a flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. So this is, uh, we're in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And by the way, he has already spent about 40 years out here taking care of sheep in the desert. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, Moses, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. I learned something right there. 
men don't listen well. You ever notice in Scripture that when God talks to men, he has to say their name twice? Moses, Moses. Saul, Saul in the New Testament. Samuel, Samuel. Right? And that's why the, you know, the married guys, you know, your wife is like, what the preacher say? And then he you know, interprets it, you know. Uh, men don't listen well. You can see it right there. So it's good. Ladies, pay attention. Help out the guys beside you so they can, you know, they get it right. Where would men be without women? Still in the garden, be no, never mind. Okay, let's get back to the text here. And he said, verse five. Just seeing you guys can laugh with mask on. And he said, draw thy not hither. I'm kidding, by the way, about still in the garden, be. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look upon God. Now let me just tell you the rest of this. So God tells Moses, he says, I've seen the affliction of my people. And I want to deliver them. And I'm sure Moses is like, yes, finally. You know, 40 years ago, I wanted to get this thing started. And then he says, and I'm calling you to deliver them. And when God gets specific with him, and let's, let's read the verse where he does. Verse 10. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And when God gets specific and says, I'm sending you... What's Moses do? He does what a lot of us do when we're asked to do something. He looks in the mirror. Who, me? Moses said unto God, verse 11, Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? There's a question in verse 11. What's the question? Who am I? You with me? I got my glass on so I can see. All right. The question is, who am I? Say that with me. Who am I? Say it again. Who am I? That's what Moses said when God says, "I'm going to send you to Pharaoh, and you're going to lead them out of Egypt." Moses' response was, "Who am I?" You know what God's answer was? Oh, Moses, you're a Hebrew, yet you've been raised in the palace. You're like a Hebrew, and yet you're like an Egyptian. And I don't really want to tell you this yet, but uh, you're also a, a Midianite. And you spent 40 years in the desert, and you're going to spend 40 years out here leading the children of Israel through this. So you have, you've been a part of three different cultures. You've got it down. You're the man for the job. Look in the mirror. Well, that's the living translation. Okay, let's get back to King James. The question was what? Moses said, say it again. You know what God's answer was to that question? Certainly, I will be with you. Did you ever ask somebody a question and they uh, give you the wrong answer? Who am I? God's answer to Moses' question, who am I, was certainly I will be with you. Hmm. Certainly, I will be with you. That's a question that you have probably asked when you've been asked to do something that seems a little big for you. Who am I? And I am confident that when you ask that question, God gives the same answer he gave to Moses. When we say, who am I? God's answer isn't, well, you are, you have, you've been. Who am I? Certainly I will be with you. Who am I? Certainly I will be with you. Our empowerment for ministry, our empowerment for ministry comes from knowing that God is with me. That's why you can serve with courage and passion. Our empowerment for ministry comes from knowing God is with me. That's why you can serve with courage and passion. You see, God's not in the habit of calling people. Let me get this up here on the uh, 
up on the slide for us. God's not in the habit of calling people to tasks that they can do on their own strength. You agree with me? God's not in the habit of calling us to things that we can do on our own strength. So when he calls us to do something that's bigger than us, and we say, who am I? Where are we looking? We're looking in the mirror. That's not where you get your power. And I'm confident God's answer to us when he calls us to something that's bigger than us, that's outside of our comfort zone, is certainly I will be with you. Say that with me. Certainly I will be with you. Say it again. Certainly I will be with you. So when we say, who am I? God says, certainly I will be with you. All right. So let's get get four words here that will help us in understanding where do we get our empowerment. Okay? The definition of empowerment It's authority, power given to someone to do something. And where do we get that? Four words for us. Number one is presence. Write that down. Presence. And we just looked at that in Moses' life. Presence. God's with me. When you are called to a task, you say, okay, I need need courage. I I need the power. I need the authority to do ministry. Where does that come from? Number one, presence. God's presence. If God's calling you to do it, then you have the authority, you have the power to do it. That's where our empowerment comes from. Number one is presence. God is with me. Sometimes it would be nice for God to say, here's why you can do it. And if God would just kind of give us a list of, you know, here's, here's, qualities you have, or here's some, some history that you have that's prepared you for this, or here's a, you know, here's talents that I've given you, or gifts I've given you, and, and therefore so now you can do this, right? But if that's what empowers us, is if our past, if our talents, our gifts, if that's what empowers us, and then we run up against the wall and things get really difficult, like it did for Moses in Egypt, then what? Then what? I should have been more prepared. I wish I had these gifts, or I wish. But when your empowerment isn't in my giftings, but it is first and foremost that God's with me, when I hit those walls in ministry, guess what? God's still with me. And when we, when we get our empowerment from knowing God's with us, where's our focus? It's not about me. Because I'm going to make mistakes in ministry. I'm going to blow it from time to time. We hope those time to times are spread out. Sometimes they're not so much. But God's with me. God's with me. So the first way we get our empowerment is from presence. God is with me. The second one is plan. Plan. God's got a plan for me. God created me. God created me. And I can allude to this just a little bit in talking about Moses' story. You know, Moses was somebody special. You know, God's hand was on him, and, you know, he goes in the the bush, and he didn't rock it over. When he was in the basket in in the river, he didn't tip it over and drown, and and God sends the right person. It's like, you know, he's a special person. You know, God doesn't make special people. He just makes ordinary people. And when we are committed to doing whatever he wants us to do, to go in wherever he calls us, he uses us. God's words to Jeremiah were, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Jeremiah is a lot like Moses, an ordinary guy. A lot like you, an ordinary person. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. What's, what's, that, what's that say to you? If God knew who you were before you were created, and there's only one you. Now, I'll put those two together. You're unique. God's got a plan for you. Am I on to something? You think so? How many of you believe that God has a plan for you? If God created me, then he has a plan for me. 
And just like for Moses, God has a plan for him and we can see it. That's not where our empowerment starts, but it's definitely a part of it. Knowing that first God's with me and then also understanding God's got a plan for me. I'm not here trying to do ministry just because I can't find something else to do. God's hand is on me. God wants me to do what I'm doing. God's got a plan for me. God created me. What I find interesting as I think about God having a plan for us, if we were to continue on in this text on Moses, and we'd continue to read through Exodus chapter 3, when Moses says, oh, who am I? And what did God say to that? There we go. And the rest join in. Certainly, I it was just the ladies that said that first time. That was something. Yeah, they weren't, men weren't listening. It's true. You know, we don't change. When Moses said, who am I? God said, you would have thought that had been enough for Moses, but it wasn't. That was, just a, that was just one of four excuses that he had. And he goes on to give excuses to God. You know, oh, you know, they're not going to believe me when I come and, and speak to them. So God gives him a sign with his rod uh, and then tests the submission out by you know, turning to a snake and saying, pick it up. I would have flunked that one. Uh, you know, he picks it up in his back, and these different things. And then he says, well, you know, I, I'm slow of speech. I'm not gifted at speaking. And God gets after him. Well, who made your tongue? And, and then he, finally, Moses tells God this. He says, send somebody else. You ever wonder why God didn't? You ever ask somebody to do something, and after like the third, fourth time, they keep giving excuses? You're like, you know what? I should have never asked that. And you're just hoping they say, just get somebody else. Because you don't want them to do it, right? You want somebody that really wants to do it, you're going to have to do it, right? God's response to Moses' fourth excuse was God got angry. He says, okay, I'm going to send Aaron, and he's going to be a mouth you. Now go. And, and Moses knew, okay, shut up and go, buddy. You're done. Uh, God did send somebody else. Moses was created to do this job. That's because Moses is somebody special. No, he's not. I think God created every one of us to do a work. And I wish more Christians believed that. God's got a plan for you. That's not what empowers us. It starts with knowing God's with me, his presence, but then also knowing God has plans for me. It wasn't just Moses. It's not just Jeremiah. God's hand is on your life. God's got plans for you. God doesn't do anything by accident. God makes things with a purpose in mind. And, and the crown of all creation was us as human beings. It's only us and all he created that can really connect with him. God's got plans for you. That can encourage us. In fact, when life gets difficult, if I know God's with me and I know that God's got a plan for me and I'm doing what he wants me to do, that's empowering. I wonder how many of you are here tonight and you believe not only is God that God's with you, but that God has a plan for you. Maybe. Maybe you think that's a little bit arrogant to say, well, God's got a plan for me. No, it's not. Well, if you admitted that to somebody else, somebody said, uh, are you doing, are you following God's plan for your life? And if you were to say yes, well, that's not like you just got it all together. I, I don't think it needs to be that. We'll come back and we're going to talk more about this at the end. The first P is presence. God's with me. The second P is plan. God created me. Let's look at the third one. Preparation. Preparation. And again, when God is calling Moses, God had definitely prepared Moses for the task he was calling him to do. But that wasn't his answer to, who am I? Your preparation isn't what gives you your courage and your passion. 
but the preparation is a part of the empowerment. You look back at Moses' life, and God had prepared him. God was in the process of preparing him to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. We're going to get into culture tomorrow morning. When Moses went back to Egypt, he could go into the presence of Pharaoh and he didn't make all these cultural blunders because he knew the Egyptian culture. So he was able to go in there without being offensive and do all these wrong, you know, he knew to take off his shoes at the door or he knew to, you know, to accept the, the drink the first time or, you know, whatever the different cultures are or, you know, he lied to him or whatever he needed to do. He knew what to do in Egypt because that's where he grew up, okay? He even knew how to communicate with him because that's a language he learned, all right? When he, uh, and yet, he's a Hebrew. You know, God tends to uh, raise up somebody from his own people to lead his own people. So it wasn't like he had to come in there and say, you know, my ancestors killed all your dads, and I'm sorry about that, but I think I'm supposed to lead you guys out of bondage. No, that had never flown, right? I'm one of you guys. I'm a Hebrew. So, so he was a Hebrew, and yet he knew all the customs, the culture of Egypt. And then when he goes to take him through the desert, the wilderness, hey, he spent 40 years there. In fact, later on, M Moses is called a Midianite. You know, one time, he's, we know he's a Hebrew, but then he's been called a, an Egyptian. He's called a Midianite uh, because he looked and he talked like them too. So God's hand was on Moses in preparing him for this job. Preparation. Preparation. God is working in me. In fact, I believe, when I'm speaking to, uh, let me get my glasses on, make sure I never look speaking to you. Speaking to a group of conservative Anabaptists. And I think one of our weaknesses is we, we tend to push our youth into ministry. And we tend to uh, push, do ministry, do missions while we're young, and then settle down and live life. And we're very weak on preparation. God is very big on preparation. You see it in Moses' life. You see it in David's life. You know, from the time David was anointed king until he became king was anywhere from uh, 15 to 20 years. Why? He needed some training, some preparation. You think of Joseph. When Joseph was called, and, and, and so he knew God's going to use him. He knew God's giving him a vision of how God's going to, he's going to rule over his family. And God's got big things for him. He had 13 years of cleaning house, of being in prison, of serving there, before it was time for him to serve. John the Baptist. You, you can go through all scripture. You can name anybody that God calls, and there's always a time of preparation. You know, John the Baptist, you know, what a guy. It is, when, people, when he was born, people were like, you know, behold, what child? Nobody ever said that about you or me when we were born. They said that about John the Baptist, right? And then when he became of age, it's like, okay, let's anoint him. Here he goes. Ah. He was sent off to the wilderness. And then when it's time for ministry, he comes to do ministry. Preparation. God is working in me. I am not, if you're here and you're a young person tonight, I'm not trying to discourage you from doing ministry. In fact, God may be using this ministry now to prepare you, but don't skip preparation. God's big into preparation. And don't you dare believe that you do ministry while you're young, you do mission while you're young, and then you settle down. You settle down in heaven, all right? So we're going to be faithful. What you need to be doing now, if, if you're anywhere from, if you're anything under 30, like you're right now, you're preparing for the rest of your life. God may be using this now, using you in ministry, but really, he's preparing you so that you can serve the long haul. And then we'll settle down in heaven. Don't skip the preparation. God is working in me. And God may have you working in urban ministry somewhere. God may have you on a foreign field somewhere, and you're doing ministry, and yet... You, you can acknowledge this. I look back in, in my life and see several times, really the ministry that was happening was God was doing some things in here. God was teaching me some things and preparing me for what he has me doing for the law. Preparation. God is working in me. That's not the foundation of our empowerment. It starts with presence. God's with me. And then knowing that plan. God's got a plan for me. God created me. 
And then also understanding preparation. God's working in me. We got one more. People. People. God gives different gifts. Oh, we, we need this. And Ephesians 4 talks about this. God uses teams. If you want to be involved in, in doing something that's, that's bigger than you, you're involved in impacting lives, work with people. Don't try to do it by yourself. There's nothing significant that I have been involved with has been things I've done on my own. Anything that I have done that has really impacted people has been because I've been a part of a team. God uses teams to accomplish His work. He gives differing gifts for the purpose of getting His work done here on earth. And I have uh, up here Ephesians 4. Uh, Ephesians 4 starts out telling us to walk worthy of the vocation that we're called. Talks about seven ones, which, uh, it, it, because you guys are in ministry, let me just give this to you. You can come back and look about it later. You can talk about it with your team. But how do you know when you can work with another another ministry or another maybe they're another denomination there's a church across the street like can we really do this outreach with them or can we interact you want to know a test to, to know who all you can interact with Ephesians chapter 4 there's seven ones there you got to agree on the seven ones if you don't you can't do you, you can't interact with, or you can't do ministry with them so seven ones they talks about there and then he goes on and he talks about these gifts here he said wherefore he says when he ascended up on high he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men and these are the gifts he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. And here's why. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. God has given different gifts to different people. So, we want to do ministry and we want to impact people. We want to make a difference for the kingdom. Work with people. Don't try to be a lone ranger. Don't try to do it on your own. A few of the things that I've been blessed to be a part of, uh, one of them was that I go in Thailand. And God, God asked if I'd be his assistant administrator and move with them back in 2006 to help start the work of Igo. Uh, and by the way, six months before we moved to Thailand, I was at Urban Youth Workers Retreat. That was in 2006. How many years ago was that? 15? That's been a long time ago. That's a good sign that this ministry is was meeting a need then, and it's still going. Uh, and by the way, is, this isn't Keyshawn's thing. It's not just him. It's not just Jesse's thing. It's not just what. There's a team of people. Remember that. Remember that. God works through teams. And when you have different people, this board is made up of what, five, six people that work together. Good things happen. Don't try to do it on your own. When we, when we went to to Thailand and working with Igo, God has used Igo. And I'm confident one of the reasons that God was able to, to use Igo was because it wasn't just Val's thing. He made sure it wasn't. It, it was a team of people. And what we did there, we worked as a team. Anything else that I've, that I've done? Always a team. Is what you're involved in, is it your thing or is it a team thing? People. What's interesting is uh, it's a shame that sometimes we as Christians don't get that. Even the world knows that. Some of you, maybe maybe just the men, maybe more of you would, would recognize the name Kevin Durant. He's a basketball player, uh, makes his home in New York now. A, a decent, a really good basketball player. Okay, let's be honest, he's really good. Uh, and back in uh, just last last month, about three weeks ago, he was. His critics were after him because now he's gone from you know 
Oklahoma City to Golden State, and then he won several titles in, uh, with the Warriors in Golden State, and, and now he's in New York with the Brooklyn Nets. And, and somebody made this attack on him. You know, he, he could never win any titles by himself. He just you know, he has to go where all the other good guys are. So he's teaming up with, uh, with Irving and, and uh, Harden and all those guys or whatever. This is what Kevin Durant said. At the men's attention. I'll never be able to do anything that I really want to do on earth by myself. I don't look up to him, Kevin Durant, as a role model at all. But those are good words. In answer to his critics, you couldn't win a title by yourself. You're right. I could never accomplish his exact words. I'll never be able to do anything that I really want to do on earth by myself. Here's a name that some of you will recognize also, Tom Brady. I don't think he's here too good. Um, I don't think he'd want to come. He's probably not into this. Pretty famous too, he's a quarterback by the way. Uh, he responded to Durant's tweet, tweet with this. Absolutely right. Always about teamwork. Here's two guys that I'm quite certain don't profess anything about Christianity. They're some of the most successful sports figures in our world today. And their response is, it takes team. I couldn't do it on my own. Why on earth would we, who are God's people, think that we can really do something on our own. People. People. God gives different gifts. So your four P's. Presence, plan, preparation, people. As we think about empowerment, it starts with presence. When Moses says, who am I? God says what? When you say, who am I? God says what? Certainly I yeah. God, God's with you. Plan, God created me. Preparation, God's working in me. People, God gives different gifts. Now, one of the questions that can come up as being people of ministry, and when you start doing ministry, the opportunities are endless. If you put yourself into the ministry that God has you right now, there's a thousand other ministries out there that would gladly use you. Sometimes it can get confusing or difficult to discern, well, what am I supposed to do? Now, I'm doing ministry here at home, but the board called me and they want me to serve in New York City, and the need is great. They also need workers in Greece, and they just called me about that one. And, but my home church wants me here, and the ministry here wants me. So what do I do? How many of you can relate to that type of struggle? God, what do you want me to do? I've got so many options. How many of you can relate to that? If God has a plan for me, then I got to make sure that I get it right. If God created Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, well, you know, he better turn and look at the bush and then so God gives attention or, you know, the children of Israel will still be in Egypt, right? Listen, we're going to wrap tonight up on this one. Many, many Christians don't like this idea that God has a plan, as in a specific plan for us. Because if God has a specific plan, what if I don't get it right? Then I mess up the whole system, right? It's much more popular to believe like this. God's created me for his glory, and he delights 
on watching me choose different ways that I can use my gifts and my abilities to build his kingdom. And so whether I say yes to this call in New York City, or whether I say yes to go to Greece, or whether I say yes to stay at home, hey, all of them are building God's kingdom, and I'm going to all for his glory, so God doesn't really care. Just go for it and do it. That's the most common belief. I don't know where you're at tonight, and I'm not going to ask. Uh, but you know what happens if... If that is true, and by the way, I've never found a case like that in Scripture. Every time God called somebody, he had a specific plan in mind for them. I'm firmly convinced that there is only one me, only one you, and that you're not an accident, and God has never done anything without a plan, so I don't know why all of a sudden it would shift when it comes down to us, right? If it's true that God says, just serve me, just pick what you want, it's kind of like a smorgasbord. And I like to eat at smorgasbord places, right? Because when you go through the line, you can pick and choose. You know, you want this. And we as men, we like the smorgasbord. We have all the meat. And we just got a plate that's full of meat before you get to the salad. We don't even care. Uh, you know, our wives can eat the salad. It works out good, right? So we, can, we pick what we want. If God's plan is like a smorgasbord, you pick what you want to do. Okay, Greece. What are you going to do when it gets hard in Greece? Are you going to say, wow, I should have stayed at home. I wish I would have went to New York City. When we went to Grenada in 2001, it got hard. And I got stretched in ways that I didn't expect to get stretched. Uh, life got really hard. But I was so glad that I was there, not because I picked Grenada. Because if I did, then I'd be like, why? Why did I pick a rainy? I should have stayed back in Minnesota. You know, I froze to death. At least I wouldn't have had the problem that it here. Uh, you know, or, or why, why don't I go here? Well, when we're in Thailand and it gets difficult, oh, why did I go here? I should have been. If we believe that God's plan is like out there for us and you just pick what what, then guess who's in charge? You are. And you better get it right. I'm convinced that God's hand is on every one of us. God's been preparing you and he has a plan for you. The question isn't, you just look at the screen, the question isn't, what's God's plan for me? And see, when we try to, we try to get around that one of a specific plan and we like this smorgasbord idea because it's not restricted, it's not like we just have to get it right, we're asking the wrong question. The, the question isn't, what's God's plan for me? The question is this, am I willing to do it? Am I willing to do it? That's the right question. And I'm confident that a true step of faith is saying, yes, Lord, before you know what you're saying yes to. As I look back at my life, and let's just say the front of the stage would be a timeline of my life. So here's when I'm born, the end of the stage is when I'm going to die. So I, I'm 47 right now. So I, I'd like to think I'm about halfway through life. All right? Actually, I still feel younger than 47. Maybe I'm here. I'll be a long time. Okay? So that's the end. I could be. I could be more like this. You know, maybe I'll never see my 48th birthday. So maybe it's right here. Put yourself in my shoes. This is the timeline of your life. That's where you're born. Here's where you're at. Wherever it may be, that's where you're going to die. Here's how you and I look at our life. And I'm just helping us understand this whole aspect of God having a plan and taking a step of faith. God looks at our life. We, are, we look at our life from where we are now back to where we came from. And I can see, you know what? So I grew up in Iowa and I can see how God has used my, my parents and, and developed me and the decisions that they made. I'm so grateful they sent me to the school I did. They didn't let me go to the school I wanted to in high school and some different things like that. Uh, the ministry things that my, my parents did. Uh, we were singing in churches and in prisons and different things like that. that they had uh, international students. They had adopted international students who would come out for holidays. We lived close to the University of Iowa. Involvement like that, uh, I got my first shot, and in fact, I still have it in ready from a man from Malaysia. They moved to, the, to Iowa to be students at the University of Iowa, and he bought a 28 shotgun for protection. 
And after being there for about a year and a half and realizing he didn't need it for protection, uh, he was going to get rid of it. So he sold it to my dad, and that was my first gun. Uh, that's kind of cool. I used to shoot gear then. But anyways, uh, my parents' involvement in, in people from other countries and so on gave me a taste for ministry. I can look back and I see all these things. Then I see God calling me in Minnesota to teach school and how that was growing and preparing me for what he had me to do in Grenada. And then Grenada was preparing me for what he had me to do in Thailand. And I can see to where God has me now. And it makes sense. But then as I look ahead, I don't know what's ahead. I've got a schedule made out for the next several years, but you guys know how 2020 went. Kind of, We changed our schedules, right? Uh, that could happen now. I don't even know. And I don't even know where the end is. You know how God looks at my life and your life? He looks at it from the end back to the beginning. You see, God knows where the end is for you and I. God knows what's from year 47 till the end where that is. God knows what's, what's ahead here. God sees it. Are you with me? God sees that. Why? Why would any one of us want to keep control of our life and tell God where we're going to serve him and how we're going to serve him? We don't even know what's ahead. He does. The issue isn't, does God have one plan for me or does he have a whole bunch of options? That's not even the issue. The issue is this. Are you willing to do whatever God wants you to do? That's the question. That's the issue. The issue isn't about, is it a smorgasbord of plans or, or is it one specific plan? And we can wrestle with this true step of faith to say, yes, God. You know, tonight some of you may really be wrestling with two different options of the ministry. You may be wrestling with, do I continue serving in this urban ministry where I'm at right now? Do I, go, do I stick on the board another year or, or do I not? You can be wrestling with these things. And, and what do we do? You know what your answer is? You say, yes, Lord, I'll do it. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. Say that with me. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. Say it again. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. Whatever you want me to do, yes, Lord, I'll do it. And we wrestle with that because we don't know what we're saying yes to. But again, we can say yes. Not because of what we're saying yes to but because we know who we're saying yes to. Cal Jamai, do you understand? That's Todd. For me. We're going to talk cross-cultural. So Cal Jamai means do you understand? Do you understand? You say Cal Jamai. Cal Jamai? Oh, yeah, okay. We don't. Yes, thank you. We're in Spanish there, right? Our wrestling. we got to stop wrestling over, you know, what's God's plan for me? Because really the issue is surrender. If you're resting over, you know, what does God want me to do? What if you just say, okay, God, I'll do it. And what if you're like, but if you're like, I don't, I don't want to say yes until I know what I'm saying yes to. Like, what if I just say, okay, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And then he's got me doing something like crazy, like, you know, serving God in Lancaster. Or uh, <laughs> serving him in Iraq, or, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, if that's what your hang-up is, you're trying to keep the reins. You're trying to be in charge. You see, if, if you can't say, yes, God, I'll do whatever you want, I'll go wherever you want me to go, until you know what you're saying yes to, you're not surrendered. So what if it is serving God in Lancaster? Or what if it is serving God in Iraq? Knowing the difference, is that, does that give you the courage then to say yes? Or the authority to say no? Are you willing to say yes, Lord? I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. And I'm confident, I'm confident, young people and old people, I'm confident that that's where the empowerment comes, is when we, when we lay down the controls and we say, yes, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Because I know you're going to be with me. I know you've got a plan for me. I know you've been preparing me. You're going to continue to prepare me. And you're going to bring the people into my life that I'm going to be able to be a part of a team to get your work done. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. 
Some of you are hung up on this wall. If I said yes, Lord, tonight because you've been wrestling, you're saying, okay, God, I'll say yes, but then what I do? It's simple. Go home Sunday afternoon, right where you came from, and continue doing what you're doing with all your heart. You will never find a time where it's right to be unfaithful. So go back, be faithful where you're at now, all the while saying, yes, God, I'll, if, if you don't want me at home, if you don't want me wherever you're serving now, if you don't want me there, just show me something different, I'll go. God's a good communicator. Amen? God's a good communicator. When God spoke to Moses, he got it. You often, well, how am I going to know what God's telling me to do? That's not the question. That's never the problem. The problem is always in our submission. When we're submitted, we're saying, yes, God, and then we're faithful, you'll hear from God. He'll tell you. And he'll tell you on time. Never early. Never late. On time. God's good communicator. we got to get out of here. I wonder, I wonder what God's saying to your heart right now. Are you getting your strength from the mirror? Some of you needed to hear that part. Or is it, certainly I'm with you. But to me, the big issue, and what I want you to walk out of here tonight is confidence that God's, God's with me. God's got a plan for me. And my job is just surrender and then be faithful. Let's pray. Father, come to the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that you would speak to hearts tonight. You know what the wrestlings are. You know what the decisions, uh, the different things that we're, each one of us are facing. God, some people are, are here and they, they beat themselves up. They think, yeah, I don't have any talents. I can't do anything. And some people on the other side, and they're always looking in the mirror and getting their strength from there. God, help us to get our eyes off ourselves. Help us understand it's your presence. You're with us. Father, help us to surrender so that it's not about our plans for life, but it's about your plan. And that we'll be faithful through the preparation. And that we're not going to try to be a one-man show, but we're going to be involved in working with people to get your work done. Father, tonight, for the person that's been wrestling with trusting you about their future, Father, help them, to, help them really get a good grasp of how you look at their life from the end to the beginning. And I pray they just say, yes, Lord, I'll do it. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Father, you, you do a work in our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.